before I get started, I want to give a shout out to Barry Little, Terrell Steps, Drega001, Lost in Translation Podcast, KP from KC5, a film critic named Damon Clayton, Iceberg G85, and Dominic Harris for their contribution to the channel. And I'd also like to thank Inu Blue for the gifted memberships. And a special shout out to Marvin McGee Jr. for the $15 donation. Damn! Eric Jones for the $25 donation. Hallelujah! Dale77 for the $30 donation. Very shagadelic, baby, yeah! Zabar Cole for the $40 donation. <laughs> and Robert Horton with the $150 donation. To my moderator, Swing Out Museum. My man. And Darkroom Media 007. You go, girl. For their $20 donations. And if you'd like to donate to the channel directly, Cash App and PayPal are available. Just let me know in the for section if it's okay for me to thank you publicly, or else I'll assume you'll want to remain anonymous. And here we go. Layman's Journal Chapter 223 The Book of Exodus Chapter 1 tells the story of how the Hebrew people became slaves in Egypt, and it was largely because they weren't supposed to be there. They were supposed to be in the Promised Land, somewhere several hundred miles away from Egypt, establishing their own nation. But due to an act of jealousy, treachery, and flat-out disobedience, they wound up in Egypt, and they were living there as guests of the Pharaoh, or King of Egypt, instead of going back to the place where God wanted them to be. And when the Pharaoh that invited them to live there died, as well as the generation of rulers that remembered how he revered them, a new Pharaoh, with no connection to the previous, ushered in a new dynasty, one that had no affinity for the Hebrews. And so this new Pharaoh looked around and said, Look at the Hebrew people, these children of Israel. There are too many of them. They're too powerful. And they're taking over our country. They're stronger than us and we can't trust them. Eventually they'll overtake us, side with our enemies, and conquer us. We need to do something about them. We need to stop them from growing. So he made them slaves. And he assigned brutal taskmasters, hoping he could tear them down with labor. But the more the Pharaoh and Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Hebrew people multiplied and the more paranoid the new pharaoh and the Egyptians became. So the new pharaoh worked them even harder, making their lives even more bitter. And that didn't work either. They kept growing. They kept getting stronger. Then pharaoh gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. He said, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, terminate him. If it's a girl, let her live. But, because the midwives feared God, they refused the Pharaoh's orders, and they allowed the boys to live. Hold on, let me repeat that. Because the Hebrew women feared God, they refused to help Pharaoh destroy their men. Because they feared God, they chose to keep their men. That's a powerful statement, and there's a lot I can say about that, as it is a far cry different than the propaganda we hear now as black men in our community. And did you notice how Pharaoh went to the women to undermine the men, in order to destroy the community as a whole? That's the same tactic that the devil used in the Garden of Eden. He approached Eve, the woman, and used her as a conduit to destroy humanity. But that's another topic, so I digress. But as a result of their obedience, as a result of them keeping their men, God blessed the Hebrew midwives, and their people as a whole continued to grow stronger. Then the new pharaoh ordered all Egyptians to throw every newborn Hebrew boy they find in the Nile River. And only the Hebrew boys. Again, the girls were allowed to live. But apparently, the Egyptian people thought that was too extreme. Many of them didn't go through with the order. Even his own daughter, she adopted a Hebrew baby she found in the river. And that baby boy, of course, grew up to be Moses, who Pharaoh hypocritically allowed her to raise as a prince of Egypt. So Pharaoh learned that bilateral oppression doesn't work. To wipe out a people, you have to focus on the men, because the foundations of a strong society rest on the shoulders of strong men. And as long as the men are in place, the community will thrive, even under harsh conditions. That's why, when you talk about racial prejudice, it's really about destroying the men. Women catch hell too, but not to the same extent that men do. And I think that passage is a perfect parallel to the story of Rosewood. And for those who haven't seen the movie or familiar with its history, Rosewood, 
like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oscarfield, Georgia, Kawalija, Alabama, and dozens more, was a thriving black community in Florida that was destroyed after a white woman in the neighboring town of Sumner accused a black man of attacking and violating her. The movie takes place in the early 1920s, 30 years before the Civil Rights era. And even though it's a story more than 100 years old, I think it's a perfect metaphor for the issues we deal with today in the black community. And we're going to talk about it. So, let's get it. Now the movie, of course, takes a great deal of creative liberty for entertainment purposes. So a lot of what you see in the film is embellished or exaggerated. But you're going to hear several names throughout the movie that are indeed real people. Fanny Taylor, her husband James Taylor, Sylvester Carrier, his mother Sarah Carrier, Jesse Hunter, and the Bryce brothers. All of these characters are real people that played a role in what happened in the history of Rosewood. Now the facts on what led to the destruction of Rosewood change according to whom you ask. According to Fanny Taylor, the white woman who was allegedly attacked, she said the suspect was a black man. Other witnesses say it was her husband, frustrated over Fanny's unwillingness to fulfill her wifely duties in the bedroom. But the movie is based on the third account, which says Fanny was having an affair with another white man, and that it was he who attacked her, and that her claims of a black man attacking her were an attempt to cover up said affair. Whichever the case, the men of Sumner organized a mob, attacked the people of Rosewood, resulting in the demise of dozens of its black citizens and the destruction of the town. And it all took place in 1923, two years after the Tulsa riots that destroyed Black Wall Street. And the story begins with Sarah Carrier, whom everyone, including the whites, call Aunt Sarah, not only because she's a matriarch of her family, but also because she was a midwife and nanny to most of the white people living in Sumner. So even among the white community, she's seen as family, a maternal figure to all. And she's played by the incomparable Esther Rowe, who most of you know as Florida from Good Times. Next we meet Duke Purdy, played by the legendary Bruce McGill. That's him with his son Emmett Purdy, and Duke is far and away the most evil son of a bitch in the film. Now, they don't really say what happened to his wife, or that he even had one, but he's a single father raising his son Emmett Purdy, who's nothing like his father. Listen here, don't want you around that color boy no more. Ernie? Don't look right, my boy trailing around after But, see Ernie, he's a friend. And next we see where everything starts. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Duke! See any out here? No, sir. Well, one escaped off the chain gang near State Road. Name's Jesse Hunter. Might head for Rosewood. You keep an eye on him. Oh, uh, Duke, you see him. Don't shoot him. Bring him to me. All right. Now the man you see there in charge is Sheriff Walker, played by Michael Roker, someone you know him from the Guardians of the Galaxy. After that, we're introduced to Fanny Taylor and her husband James Taylor, and things aren't going well between them. James. I got a surprise for you. Oh, I wonder what it is. Mm, don't move. James, come on now. Don't look like a cow. No. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Go to work. Sarah. Fanny is played by Katherine Kellner, and her husband James is played by Lauren Dean. And again we see Aunt Sarah, who works as a maid and nanny for the Taylors. This here is the lumberyard, which appears to be the largest employer in the area, which hires whites and blacks. Next we meet Mr. Mann, the Ving Rhames character. He's a war veteran, looking for a place to settle down. Now, given the fact that Rosewood and Sumner are close-knit towns, and with him being an outsider, with a fugitive on the loose in the area, people are immediately suspicious. They think he may be this Jesse Hunter everyone is looking for. Then there's Beulah, also known as Scrappy. She's played by the lovely Elise Neal. She's Aunt Sarah's niece by blood, and as you can see, she's a teacher, and she's got her eye on Mr. Man. Afterwards, we meet Johnny Wright, played by the legendary John Voight. Now, he's an interesting character to me. As I stated earlier, there are two towns in this area, Sumner and Rosewood, that are segregated by race. The whites live in Sumner, the blacks live in Rosewood, but Johnny Wright lives in Rosewood, he owns a business there, a general store of sorts, where he sells everything from sewing fabric to shotgun shells, alcohol, and candy. 
and it seems to be the only place where blacks are allowed to shop freely. So his clientele, based on his location, is primarily black, and it's made him a wealthy man. In fact, we're led to believe he's the wealthiest man in the area. That includes Rosewood and Sumner. And again, he's done that primarily with a black customer base. And Johnny Wright is also a happily married man. That wonderful lady you see there is his wife, Mary. You see, Johnny Wright is a widower and has two kids from a previous marriage. His wife passed seven months ago, and he and his kids still miss her. And Mary, being the God-fearing woman that she is, stepped right up to be the mother of his children, even while his sons disrespect her. All right, boys, up to bed. Dad, can we please stay up just a few you minutes? You guys do what your ma said. She ain't my mom. Hey, Timothy, what'd you say? What'd you say, Timothy? Ow! What was that for? That's so you don't get to think like your brother. Get on the bed now. Get on the bed! Sorry about that, Mary Love. I guess the boys still miss her. You do too, I reckon. You're damn right I miss her. Only natural. Only been gone seven months, seven months, three days. And while she doesn't have much screen time, she's a very important figure in the movie, as she plays a strong, positive influence on Johnny's behavior. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but speaking of Johnny Wright, it's important to note that although he is somewhat friendly and cordial towards blacks, he's no ally. His relationship with the black community of Rosewood is strictly financial. I'll have much more to say on that later. But back to Johnny Wright's store. You see that beautiful chocolate goddess right there? That's Akusua Busha. Most of you know her as Nettie from The Color Purple. She plays Jewel Carrier, Aunt Sarah's niece by law. Her father is James Carrier, Aunt Sarah's brother-in-law. Now this isn't the first time we're introduced to Johnny Wright and Jewel. This is actually the second time they appear in the film. The reason why I waited until now to introduce them is, I couldn't show their first scene on YouTube, because it's him taking Jewel to Pound Town in the back of his store. <laughs> Now, the late John Singleton, God rest his soul, directed this film. And Singleton typically writes the films he directs. But he didn't write Rosewood. Rosewood was written by a white man, ironically, named Gregory Poirier. But Singleton is known for triggering his audience with racially charged moments. A great example would be this scene from his previous film, Higher Learning. Um, do you want to speak to Kristen? No, no. Um, she's not here. And even if she was here, I don't think she'd want to talk to you. I know she's there. I can hear her. Can you put her on the phone? Look, didn't I just tell you she's not here? Put her on the phone, you black bitch! What did you say? You heard me! I highly recommend that movie. It's some of his best work. But I think the relationship between Johnny Wright and Jewel Carrier... <laughs> is one of those triggering moments. Not only because Johnny already has an awesome wife at home, a woman who's been married to for less than a year, a woman who's stepmom to his rotten sons, whom he's already cheating on, but also, it's because of the way he's using Jewel. Akusu Abushia, who plays Jewel Carter, is a stunningly beautiful woman. Now, she was 31 at the time of filming, but the character is somewhere between ages 18 and 24, and she's extremely feminine. Her looks, youth, and personality make her an ideal wife. And here you have some pasty, musty-looking old man using her as if she's nothing, because he's not gonna leave his wife for Jewel Carrier. His sons don't respect the white woman they have now, for a stepmom. They sure as hell wouldn't mind the authority of a barely legal black woman close to their age. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Johnny Wright is a coward, on top of being a scumbag. He couldn't handle the social stigma of leaving a highly respected white woman in the community for a young black woman. And should she fall pregnant, he sure as hell wouldn't raise or acknowledge being the father. So again, he has no long-term plans for Jewel. She's just something that he's using. Now I'm gonna say some things. Things that are gonna come across as cruel and racially insensitive, specifically towards black women in interracial marriages and relationships. But please hear me out till the end, because although it may seem like I'm talking about you, you'll find out that I'm not. But the relationship dynamic between Johnny Wright and Jewel Carrier sort of reminds me of the black women you find in the divested swirl movement. Oh and the men who date them. Those black women tend to idolize white men, even those that are below average in looks and income, and fantasize being in relationships with them to the extent that they're willing to humiliate themselves just to be with them, much like the way Jewel is with Johnny Wright. 
And the thing that's so baffling about that movement is, it often leads to one-sided relationships. The white men who date divested swirlers don't respect them. They don't view them as wives. They're just using them for target practice, much like the way Johnny Wright is using Jewel. And I don't fault them for doing that because what man wouldn't? It's really the fault of the women who engage in that backwards way of thinking. Because at the end of the day, when those men want to get married, they always go back to their preference. Just like Johnny Wright goes back home to marry after a day of screwing Jewel. Mary, 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 love. Now I don't want to get off topic because I can make a whole video on this subject, but I need you to understand when I say these things, I'm not talking about black women who date and marry interracially. Swirling and interracial relationships on the surface may seem similar, but in actuality they are radically different. One is about love and seeking someone of good character, regardless of race, while the other is strictly about race, with no regard for love or character, and it's rooted in self-hatred, shock, and a need for attention. And if you want to hear more of my thoughts on that issue, why I further break down the distinction between the two, please check out this video. But the thing that amuses me about this scene is man's expression. He notices Jewel immediately. And who wouldn't? She's a stunningly beautiful woman. But it was customary of that time that when a lady walks into a room, a man takes off his hat and greets her. However, he also notices her putting her clothes back on as she comes out of the back room of the store. Then he looks back at Johnny Wright, and that's when he figures out what's going on, and concludes that Jewel is no lady, and thus isn't worthy of a greeting. It's subtle, but it's his way of disregarding her or refusing to acknowledge her. But look at the way she glares at Mr. Man. Even though the stench of Johnny Wright is still on her, the residue of his seed inside her, she's still attracted to Mr. Man. Next, Mr. Man introduces himself to Scrappy. And I'm showing this scene to highlight the contrasts between the way that he treats Scrappy and the way that he treated Jewel. Happy not, not <coughs> Morning, teacher, ma'am. Wonder if you can tell me where man find himself a good meal. Y'all going inside. Well, my name ain't teacher, ma'am. It's Beulah. Folks I know call me Scrappy. Well, folks I know call me man, Miss Scrappy. Nice to meet you, Mr. Man. Likewise. Do you notice how he addresses her as ma'am? Which is a term of endearment and respect. How he smiles and takes off his hat while speaking to her. He engages her because he's smitten with her. That's completely different from the way that he treated Jewel. As a matter of fact, he didn't treat Jewel any kind of way. He simply refused to acknowledge her. So apparently Scrappy and Mr. Man went on to have a great conversation because she invites him over to her family home for dinner where he meets her cousin, Sylvester Carrier, who's played by Don Cheadle. He's on Sarah's son, Jewel and Scrappy's cousin and head of the Carrier family. And as is customary of that time, when a man is sweet on a girl, he has to meet the man responsible for her, which in this case is her big cousin, Sylvester. The two of them talk, they like each other, and Sylvester invites him in for dinner, where the whole family is gathered. And we also get a brief introduction to Jew's parents. More importantly, her father, James Carrier, and his wife. And as you can see, Jewel still has eyes for Mr. Man. But it's clear, he's got his sights on Scrappy, and the feeling is reciprocal. Now I want to stop right here and make a quick side note. Rosewood is based on a true story that took place in 1923. And while it does take some creative license, it's still grounded in reality. The carriers are real people, and the family dynamic you see here is actually how black families operated back in the day. And this is significant because this is also around the same time that The Color Purple, a fictional story based on characters that did not exist, also took place. And again, I want you to notice the contrast between what is real and what is fake. In the real world, there is no mister. There are no men like Seeley's father. Now I'm not saying that bad black men did not exist. What I'm saying is there are no black men buying and trading black girls as if they're slaves forcing them to be child brides, and using them as if they're blow-up dolls and punching bags. There was never a culture of forced arranged marriages in our community. Even in Rosewood, a community where black men own everything, they do not have systemic authority over black women. They are responsible for them, but they do not own them. Now, Mr. Man is considerably older than Scrappy. Oh, you be Scrappy? I'm 17. My mind's telling me no. But my body, my body's telling me yeah. 
But he's at that dinner because Scrappy invited him, because she likes him, because she wants him, and because she chose him. I mean, look at the way she's sitting there, cheesing, almost as if she's mocking Jewel for getting what she could never have. And it's all because she's sitting next to Mr. Man, her boothang. If anything, she's the one pushing or forcing marriage. And I would also like to add, did you notice that there's no loud mouth hooligan like Sophia sitting at the table with her coven of obese, angry women emasculating every man in the room, declaring that women and children aren't safe around men? Again, this is what life was really like for black people growing up in the South. I know because my father grew up in that era and none of that shit that Alice Walker wrote actually happened. <laughs> And now that I've gotten that off my chest, let's get back to the story. Oh, and that woman you see standing next to Carrier, that's his wife Gertrude. And the actress who plays her is actually Don Cheadle's wife in real life. So Scrappy had an issue with a white man named Andrews, who was provocatively whistling and catcalling her while she was on her way to school. And Sylvester went over to have a talk with Mr. Andrews. Scrappy, now I had a talk with Mr. Andrews on your behalf today. What about Mr. Andrews? Mama, that old cracker caught himself whistling at Scrappy and all that. I went over there to give him some words. Sylvester, what you said to them people now? Mr. Andrews, come to have a word with you about my cousin. Now I expect you to show her some respect. You expect, boo? I don't like Scrappy feeling scared around nobody. They're yeah, threatening that? Ain't no threat needed. I'm just saying I don't mess with your peoples. I don't want you messing with mine. Now, thank you very kindly. Now, this, of course, leads to an argument between Sylvester and his mother, Aunt Sarah. Sylvester, you can't talk to white folks like that and not speck a rope around your neck. Look, times is changing, mama. Now, I ain't no sharecropper. Times ain't never changed for no crackers, boy. I know that, mama, but what, it's all right for them to whistle and scrap it? No, that ain't right. Again, the movie takes place in 1923, and Aunt Sarah looks to be in her late 60s, early 70s, which means she was likely born in the mid-1850s. So she was born a slave, and she remembers what that time was like for black people, and thus thinks the idea of a black man warning or threatening a white man as dangerous, even blasphemous, as does her brother James Carrier, who agrees with her. She has no concept of black men or black people in general being defiant towards whites. But Sylvester has a completely different mindset, and he's somewhat a radical for that time or troublemaker, because he sees himself as being equal to whites, not inferior, and thus has no issue confronting them for being disrespectful. And that's also important to note because he's a part of that generation of black men who were builders. These men erected schools, churches, and started banks. They created and ran entire towns like Rosewood, and they were the parents of men like Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, and women like Rosa Parks. All of those activists that we learned about from the 50s and 60s were raised by men like him, and they taught their children to challenge injustice. I also want you to know that even though Aunt Sarah is the matriarch, the big mama of the family, Sylvester being a man is still head of the household. He's the dominant voice and authority. He's the reason why Mr. Man had to check with him before coming in, and that's why he sits at the head of the family table and says the prayer because that's likely the role that his father had. And when he died, that mantle of responsibility was passed down to him, being the eldest male of his bloodline. And what we'll later see throughout the movie is the way Aunt Sarah, Scrappy, Jewel, and all the women in the family mind his authority. Now, the reason I point that out is to dispel this notion that black people are matriarchal or gynocratic in nature, that we naturally tend to build our family structures and communities around female authority. That's complete BS. The matriarchy or gynocracy is a byproduct of the fragmentation of the black family, which started in the late 60s. It was a direct result of LBJ's Great Society, which led to black women choosing government assistance instead of their men when it came to raising children. That's when our family structures and communities shifted from men to women being in leadership. So it's not something that happened naturally. It was a direct result of government intrusion. Again, that's another topic I could lecture on for hours, so I'll digress. So just as I alluded to earlier, Rosewood is a very affluent town. The people there are self-sufficient. They aren't sharecroppers or beggars. There are proud, successful people thriving in the Deep South. Well, I'm Sarah Thang, Rosewood. Colored folks have on earth. Best place these old eyes ever seen. Colored folks own all the land around here, all the businesses too, except for Mr. Johnny Wright's store. And he a halfway decent white man, if 
ever was such a thing. Most of us doing better than folks over in Sumner. In the next scene, we're at a New Year's Eve celebration, and people are dancing, drinking, and having a merry time. Scrappy looks exceptionally beautiful in her party gown as she continues to pursue Mr. Man. Remember, this ain't the color purple, so she gets to choose her husband. But everyone is having a great time except for Jewel. Now she looks fabulous, as beautiful as can be, but none of the men at the party are approaching her. They're ignoring her the way Mr. Man ignored her earlier, because they know what she does in Mr. Wright's store, and they don't respect her. They don't see her as a woman, and that's expected, but what I don't understand is why she looks so sad. Again, she lives in Rosewood. This is a very affluent black community. The men here are successful and self-sufficient. Many of them are outperforming their white counterparts in the neighboring town. Did she honestly think black men of that caliber would want to marry a woman that does what she does? She's quickly learning that being Mr. Wright's recreational receptacle doesn't increase her status as a woman, nor make the men around her jealous. To the contrary, it's having the opposite effect. Again, shout out to the divesters. This is how we see you. This is how much we care. In the next scene, it's morning, and we get a glimpse into Mr. Man's past. He seems to be having a nightmare about his time in the military. He appears to have what we know now as PTSD, which leads to an awkward exchange between he and Scrappy. But everything simmers down, and he tells her that he plans on buying a piece of land and building a home here. I'll be here a couple more days anyway, thinking about looking in on that piece of land over there. <laughs> Which of course excites her because she's got her eye on him and she's determined to make Mr. Man her husband. Next, we're taken back to the Taylor residence where we were introduced earlier to Fanny Taylor, the woman that Aunt Sarah works for. And as I alluded to before, she's the Me Too Believe All Woman figure, the woman who kickstarted the whole Rosewood massacre by claiming that a black man attacked her. But here's what really happened. You've been double timing me. See that Mary and Miss Conley over in Wiley. Where are you going? Don't turn your back on me. When I talk! Damn swamp tramp! What you find, man? What you think you're doing here, me? You little swamp tramp! Yes, that's Robert Patrick. Most of you remember him as T-1000, the iconic villain from Terminator 2. So yeah, Fanny was cheating on her husband with some guy. Now we don't learn the name of Fanny's lover. In fact, he's simply referred to as the lover in the credits. But now he's on the run because Fanny, on top of being an erratic woman, is a married woman. And he's not certain what she'll do. So he's got to get out of town. And fortunately for him, he runs into this idiot. Hey! Hey, anybody! Hey, boy! Yes, sir. You traveling, man? Who asking, sir? Who does the hell? He ain't our problem. He a mason. I took the oath same as us. He's a white mason. And you think he'd help you? I am tell you, boy, I swear, sometime you ain't got more sense than some of these horses. Yeah, but let me tell you something. I ain't no boy. As a man, as a mason. Wait a minute. Hey, boy. Yes, sir. In case you didn't hear earlier, that's Aaron Carrier, Jewel's brother, James Carrier's son, Scrappy and Sylvester's cousin, and Aunt Sarah's nephew by law. And I get it, it's the Deep South in 1923's America, just 58 years removed from slavery, in an era that predates the Civil Rights Movement. Blacks are free, but blacks are not equal. And back then, a black man couldn't look a white man in the eye. He had to look away or look down in submission, even if that white man called him a boy. He had to answer in a respectful tone. But there's no reason for him, Aaron Carrier, to be so bashful around Fanny's lover. First of all, he's coming to him, a black man, for help. That alone should have told him something is wrong, that he must have done something awful. Because, as we'll find out later, there are plenty of other white masons he could have gone to. So why is he sneaking off to the black side of town 
asking to be smuggled out of the area in a hurry. Now, Sam Carter, the blacksmith, picked that up right away. That's why he didn't want to help him. So there's no reason for Aaron to be so respectful of him. He could have told him to F off. He should have told him to F off. But Aaron is quick to huff up at Sam Carter for calling him a boy. So he couldn't man up to the white felon, the white felon who's on the run. But he's got all the courage in the world when it comes to checking a black man. I'm going to get back to the film, but I just had to get that off my chest. Jewel and her brother Aaron have to be the most frustrating characters in this movie. I don't know what it is about them, but they have no problem letting people use them to their own detriment and demise. So yeah, thanks to those dumbasses, the lover, the man who really attacked Fanny, escapes town. Now Fanny is in a bit of trouble. Her husband will be home soon, and she's got to explain how she got all those bruises on her. Obviously, she can't tell him the truth, so she has to come up with a story. Something that he and the entire community will believe. Help! Help me! Help! Help me! Oh, what's the matter now? Yeah. It was a nip! Oh, he broke in my house and he beat me up! It was a nip! And there it is, Little Miss Me Too, Little Miss Believe All Women, Amber Heard's inspiration, put on a powerful performance. I'm sure Emmett Till's accuser, Carolyn Bryant, may she rot in hell, would have been proud if she saw this. This of course alerts the attention of Sheriff Walker, and notice how he sweet talks her. Oh, 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 jeez, Ellis, I'm showing you. I just got beat. I was beat badly, badly. He was so big. He's so black, that boy. He speaks to her as if she's a child, like she's a toddler. Now, I'll give Sheriff Walker some credit. He doesn't believe Fanny, and he asks her again. <laughs> we know each a long time, huh? Tell me the truth. Was it true now colored? Don't this to you. Yes, he was colored! And there are several reasons why he doubts Fanny. One of them being is he knows the men in that town and what this potentially means. And he also knows a thing or two about Fanny's reputation. But she doubles down and he begrudgingly goes along with it because the mob is gathering and word is quickly spreading throughout town. Sheriff Walker then asks Aunt Sarah if she knows anything. You seen this boy, Sarah? Ain't got to mess around. We got to do something. I agree with you. No, Mr. Ellis, I ain't seen nothing. Now, when I first saw this scene as a kid, I was angry with Aunt Sarah because she knows what happened. And I thought to myself, why didn't she just tell the truth? But in hindsight, I understand why. Sarah has been watching this whole situation play out, and she's no fool. People are already riled up, and they're determined to go to war over this. So if she tells them what really happened, she'd be the first one they deal with. So while all of this is going on, Man and Sylvester go down to a local auction. Like he told Scrappy, Man is looking to settle down in Rosewood. And although I didn't show it earlier, there's a five acre parcel of land for sale by a man named John Bradley, who also happens to be black. The problem is, it's adjacent to Johnny Wright's store. So Johnny Wright feels entitled to the property. He's already made big plans for it. You own that plot of land across the way? I will, this time tomorrow. Go on that auction tomorrow. Get that plot of land. I get Bradley's five acres, build some bins out back, sell feed, make enough money a few years, we'll move to Gainesville. Open a bigger store, biggest I ever seen in Florida. Yeah. And everyone in town, including John Bradley, assumes he's going to buy it. But man has big plans too. He intends to build a home for he and Scrappy. And all of this leads to a nasty exchange. Bradley, you got the deed? Uh, yes, sir, I do, Mr. Andrews. No, no, boy, I didn't pay for it yet, John. <laughs> We got to sell it first. Here, give it here. Give it here, boy. We got here five acres in Rosewood, adjacent to Mr. Johnny Wright's store. So there's his cash only. 52, 52, who give me 52 down front? 53, 53, 53 for Monroe. 54, 54, 54, who give me 54? John Wright again. Thank you, John. 55, 55. 55 dollars. Boy, you know that's $55 for each acre. That's damn near $300. Yes, sir, I do. Thank you, kindly. Cash. I have $55. 5850. 
Again, Johnny Wright is determined to have that property, and after a long back and forth, he gets fed up and took a gander at what he does next. Sixty dollars. Boy, how you planning on paying three hundred dollars? You got a bag full of gold? Could be, sir. Henry, can't you see what this boy's doing? He ain't gonna buy nothing. He's just driving up the price for old Bradley. With all due respect, Mr. Wright, that what you believe, maybe you should stop bidding. Yeah, he said it. That boy. Again, Johnny Wright presents himself as a friend of the Negro. He lives in their community, lets them shop in his store. But do you see how quickly his true nature comes out when one of them challenges him? Men like Johnny Wright love you as long as you stay in your place, as long as they see you as being beneath them. But the moment you step out of line, the moment you refuse to eat from their hand, that's when they turn on you. And again, this is the guy that Jewel Carrier is sleeping with on the side. And this is how he sees her and the people in her community. But shortly after that moment, the auction is interrupted. Word about what happened to Little Miss Me Too, Little Miss Believe All Women, Fanny Taylor, has spread around town. And the good old boys are riled up. They believe it's Jesse Hunter. Remember, he was the escaped convict from earlier in the film? The man we never see? But again, look at old Johnny Wright. Who you think you are, boy? With all due respect, Mr. Wright. Long round this time tomorrow, I specs to be your neighbor, sir. Yeah, even John Bradley, the black man who's selling the land, is giving him the stink eye. Again, Bradley is an older man, probably around Aunt Sarah and James Carrier's age. He was likely born a slave, and just can't fathom the idea of a black man challenging white folks. So in the next scene, the mob assembles, and Sheriff Walker gives them instructions, and they bring in the bloodhounds to follow the scent of the man responsible for harming Fanny, and it takes them to Jewel's house, and that's her brother, Aaron. Remember, he's the idiot from earlier, the one who helped Fanny's lover get away? Let me tell you something. I ain't no boy. I was a man. I was a mason. Could you be Sam? Now, stupidity must run on that side of the family. We've already talked about Jewel, his sister, but look at what he does. Sam Carter? Uh, Sam Carter! Sam Carter! What about Sam Carter? Oh, oh. Sam Carter! Fanny Taylor! Oh, no! Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Sam took him in a wagon. He was holding the oath. So not only does he risk his life to protect Fanny's lover, but he snitches on Sam Carter, the blacksmith, and tells the mob that he was the one who helped sneak Fanny's assailant out of town. And if you remember, Sam didn't want to help him. He did because Aaron pressured him. Yet still, he gives up Sam anyway, while covering for the real suspect. But I also want you to notice Johnny White's demeanor. What you got here? Yeah, you got a good one. That's a boy. Fanny Taylor. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got us Aaron Carrier, John. You got the wrong boy. Hate to tell you, Aaron Carrier wouldn't risk a fly. You know the boy that did. He won't talk either, John. Let me talk. Yeah, hell, maybe you can get something out of him. My shoes hell clean. Aaron, this is Mr. Wright. You know something about all this? <laughs> I was supposed to talk when you choked him like that. But he don't need to talk, Johnny. He need to hang one of them trees over there. <laughs> Y'all think this is real funny? Yeah. Wait. Notice how he's acting all casual, like he's one of the mob. He's trying to play it cool, but in reality, he's nervous and doesn't want to go against them. But this is how he really feels about the situation. Boy's family as well as I. That's right, I do, you know, I know. And you know he's a good boy. Good, good people, people. good people. But we got a dilemma here, Johnny. Got a dilemma, I'm gonna tell you what it is. Hounds don't lie. The mob then turns their attention to Sam Carter, the blacksmith. They catch him, and just like Aaron Carrier, he thinks being a mason will save him. You don't know nothing. Where's Jesse Hardy? Mr. Craig, are you a mason? Yeah. You better say something, please. What? What do you know? No, Jesse Hardy. But that doesn't matter. They continue to attack him. They took his life and hung him from a tree. So they came no closer to finding Fanny's real suspect or Jesse Hunter. But now they believe Mr. Man is Jesse Hunter, even though he showed his discharge papers proving that he isn't. Your name is Jesse Hunter? No, sir. Suppose you can prove that. Got my discharge, sir. But the mob isn't trying to hear the truth. They just want to satisfy their bloodlust. Now, Sheriff Walker tries to gain control. But being the weak man that he is, he can't do anything to stop them. And by this point, he's following their lead. So, there's no law and order. It's just a mob looking for anything with a black face. Next, we're transported back to the Taylor household, and you see Fanny there getting some love and affection from her husband, James. You're always so gentle, soft touch. 
Treat me like I'm some kind of angel. You are an angel to me. I'm just a woman, James. I'm just a woman. Now, the reason why I play this clip is to highlight how much of a sucker James Taylor is. He has this Victorian view of his wife. He's got no clue who she really is. Or maybe he doesn't want to believe it. He then proceeds to tell her how crazy things have gotten and that Sam Carter was taken out by the mob. Things are getting crazy out there, Fanny. They're likely to get worse. Sam Carter's lynched already. The blacksmith? What do you do? He give that n a ride. A ride? Sam Carter? I didn't know. And this is when she begins to show some regret, but not much, as the ladies from the community show up to shower her with sympathy. Next, we see Mr. Man. He stops by the carriers to break the news about what happened to Sam Carter and where they can find his body. And later that evening, they have a meeting at the church where Sylvester Carrier makes a call to arms. Now me and Mr. Man just cut Sam Carter out a damn tree. Y'all hear me? They got my cousin Ann over in jail and something behind this business. They say it's for his own protection. Now, how that sound? What we need to do, we need to pray. Now, dear Lord... I ain't no praying mood, preacher. Now, what I want to know is right now, what y'all men's prepared to do if they run back up in here? I say, we send the women and children to Gainesville right now. We ain't going nowhere, Bradley. Now, we own this here land. We pay taxes on it. Now, we don't bother nobody around here. We keep to ourselves. Now, colored folk just can't be running all the time. There comes a time when you got to stand up and defend your rights. So you see the conflict here. Carrier wants to stay and fight. John Bradley wants to go to Gainesville, while the goofball pastor just wants to pray about it. As for Mr. Man, he wants no part of it. Mr. Man, there be some trouble around here, sir. We can show you your help. I just came from one wall, friend. Ain't looking for nothing. Let him go, Sylvester. For all we know, he could have been the one that done this thing. They said it, well, they said it was a stranger in here. Talking crazy now, preacher. Wish y'all luck. Remember, he has PTSD. So on one hand, he looks like a coward for leaving, but on the other hand, it makes sense. Most of the whites in Sumner think he's Jesse Hunter, and apparently, as do some of the people living in Rosewood. But even if he isn't, and they know he isn't, I'm sure some of them are willing to sacrifice him as a peace offering to the mob. For all we know, he could have been the one that done this thing. But the thing that bothers me is Johnny Wright. Why is he sitting in on the meeting? I guess he thinks he's a member of the tribe, but I love the fact that they ask him to leave. Mr. Wright, would you kindly excuse us, sir? And as he was leaving, he runs into Mr. Man. And he, Johnny Wright, tries to lecture him on being a coward. Things get hot. Thank God the Navy don't let in. What? Go on and say it, Mr. Wright. Thank God the Navy don't let in. I was going to say cowards. Right? I got you figured, man. You're one of them loud boys. Big talk. Figure you can say anything to a white man as long as you start out saying, with all due respect. First sign of trouble, you're ducking your head run. What you going to do when that mob come down the road? You going to grab up your rifle, defend colored folk? What you care? Man does what he has to. Ain't that right? Just like a colored boy back from the wall with a pocket full of money. You the master of Rosewood, huh? Say, boy, they trust me. How long you live here, Mr. Wright? Nine years. Been in Rosewood one night. They asking me to stay. Now you pack up your truck. See who tries to stop you from leaving. And Mr. Man is right. Johnny isn't there to take up the fight because he's no ally. Like Sheriff Walker, he's not going to stand up to the mob. He just wants to go along to get along. But for some reason, he thinks Mr. Man should fight a battle that he himself wants no part of, who nobody in town trusts to be a part of. So now it's day two of the massacre, with the county judge coming by to speak to the sheriff. He comes to examine the body of Sam Carter, the man they strung up the previous night. And listen to what he says. Multiple gunshot wounds, missing ears, fingers, various other parts. Hi, <laughs> Jesus. Your boys really got to this one, huh, Ellis? Now, for those of you who don't know, those are the clear indicators of a lynching. The missing body parts are taken from the victims as trophies, and they're not limited to fingers and ears. Oftentimes, male reproductive organs are also taken. But the judge and the sheriff have a talk, and he warns him about letting things get out of control. And Sheriff Walker assures him that he's handling the situation. Levy County is growing. Well, we need us a sheriff up here who can handle his n problem. Is that you, Ellis? Now, hold on, oh, Judge. Oh, I think I got everything under control now, Judge. Uh-huh. Mm. You can't control your colored. We're going to replace you with someone who can. But that's just lip service. Sheriff Walker has no control over the good old boys of Sumner. Like Johnny Wright, he's trying to play both sides. On the one hand, he's trying to have order. But on the other hand, 
he helped rile the people up. And Sam Carter was just day one. Those familiar with the history know the massacre of Rosewood lasted six more days. Now we're over at the Lumberyard, which is the largest employer in the area and the foreman gives the employees the day off to continue looking for Jesse Hunter, the guy they say attacked Fanny Taylor. But in reality, we all know what that means, because it's been more than 24 hours since the alleged attack took place. And as we saw earlier, the man who really attacked Fanny is long gone, and we still haven't seen Jesse Hunter. At this point, it's unlikely he even came through town, but even if he did, he would be gone as well. So what the foreman is really doing is giving them a green light to keep the massacre going. But the thing that I find significant about this scene is the fact that they make this announcement right in front of the black employees. So you could just imagine sitting there watching as the men of Sumner make plans on hunting you and your people down. So worried about what's happening in Rosewood is starting to spread to the extent that the mail carrier asks Sarah to get her people out of town. He even offers to give them a free ride to Gainesville, but Sarah politely declines. Why don't you get your people some Lord Aunt Sarah? Take them up to Gainesville for a while. Don't much like to look things around here. Things has been looking the same as long as I can remember, Mr. Price. Case. Next, we see Sheriff Walker approach Sylvester Carrier and essentially offer him the same deal, but their interaction isn't as pleasant. Sylvester, go inside the depot, Mama. Sylvester, Mama, it's all right. right. Mama, go on. Johnny, Sylvester, you know the whereabouts this Jesse Hunter? I do not. You rest that man will kill Sam Carter yet? Don't you get up there with me. I've come to warn you. There's some boys over there in Sumner let on if they was you. They wouldn't let Sundown catch them around here. Well, they ain't me. Don't you be a good boy and go visit some of your other relatives for a little while, huh? I am trying to help you here. They're all over there right now getting all full of liquor and making nooses. You hear me? Sheriff, if you really want to help, I appreciate it if you wouldn't allow them boys to come around here. Now, I was born and raised in Rosewood. This here's my home, and I'll be damned if I'm gonna let anybody run me off it. You can tell them boys that. Like I said, Sylvester Carrier is a proud man, a radical. He'd rather fight till death than run. And as we can see, Johnny Wright is there as well, watching both conversations. He saw the mail carrier begging on Sarah to leave and Sheriff Walker's argument with Sylvester Carrier. And he's frustrated. Now it's important to note, and this is entirely my conjecture, based on the familiar structure we've seen so far in the Carrier family. It is the inclination of Sarah to leave Rosewood, based on the discussion that her and Sylvester had earlier at dinner, when he told the family that he confronted Mr. Andrews for being disrespectful towards his cousin Scrappy. Sylvester, you can't talk to white folks like that and not speck a rope around your neck. Because Sarah still has that slave mindset, she doesn't like the idea of black people standing up to whites. So it's not her inclination to stay. I think she's more inclined to run. But it is Sylvester's idea to stay and fight. And this goes back to something that I said earlier, how even though Sylvester is younger, even though Aunt Sarah is the mother of the family, Sylvester, her son, is the head of the family. And that's why she, even though she's his mother, submits to his authority. Again, I bring this up as an example to disprove this notion that black people are naturally, organically matriarchal. So later, when Sylvester goes to Johnny Wright's store to buy some shells, in preparation of what's coming, Wright doesn't want to sell them to him. You don't have to settle your account before I can sell you these shells. Let me settle accounts. That's right. All right. Go home, Jewel. Girl, you best get out this store. She belongs here. She belongs right here. Now you see how you do, my cousin? Get out this store right now, Jewel. Get! Ain't you listen to nobody. Sherry, give you good advice. Why ain't you leaving? I thought you were a smart boy, Sylvester. I thought you were a smart boy. Here is your money, Mr. Wright. That should settle my account. Sylvester, My man. Again, Johnny is no ally. An ally wouldn't prevent a friend from arming himself. And do you see how he grabs Jewel as if he owns her? But Sylvester uses his patriarchal authority to tell Jewel to get out of the store. And while I commend Sylvester for doing that, as an extended family member, that's not his responsibility. James, Jewel's father, and Aaron, her brother, should have been the ones to handle that. But unfortunately, James is an older man and a stroke survivor, and her brother Aaron is clearly an idiot. That's the reason why Jewel was carrying on with Johnny Wright in the back of his store and why it took Sylvester to go and rectify that situation. But this scene also confused me because on one hand, he wanted Mr. Man to stay 
and fight the battle that he himself wasn't going to fight. But on the other hand, he doesn't want Sylvester to arm himself. So you see how he can't make up his mind? How he straddles the fence? In the next scene, we see the good old boys are settling up for their next raid on Rosewood. Now there are several things about this clip that I want you to notice. One is Sheriff Walker, the alleged peacemaker. He's in the background co-signing all of this buffoonery. Second, we see the real reason why the good old boys are doing this. Anybody's hiding Jesse Hunter, my money's on Sylvester Carey. He hates us white folk. You know he's got a piano? With a goddamn piano. I've been working all my life. I ain't got a piano. The niggas got one. Mm. And I don't. Now how'd that look? Yeah, and he's married to that white woman. <laughs> Gertrude ain't white. Oh, she look white. Well, she ain't. And that's it. There it is right there. This is all about jealousy. Paraphrasing. I'm a white man. How dare a black man be doing better than me? How dare he have a piano when I don't have one? How dare he have a pretty wife that looks white? This goes back to Pharaoh's reasoning for oppressing the Hebrew people. In Exodus chapter 1, the Hebrew people are strong, they're prosperous, just like the black people in Rosewood. And the people in Rosewood don't have equal rights, they're oppressed, just like the Hebrews in the book of Exodus. And yet they remain strong. So you can see the spirit of the Egyptians, the spirit of Pharaoh, moving in the men of Sumner. They're jealous, they're angry, and they're paranoid. Now, later that evening, we're taking back to Sylvester Carrier's home. He's celebrating his son's birthday with his mother Aunt Sarah, his wife Gertrude, cousin Scrappy, and a house full of children. And here comes the mob, armed and led by Sheriff Walker, the peacemaker, marching on his home in the middle of the night, convinced that he's hiding an escaped convict in a house full of children. Mom, mom, hold on. Get out the window, mom. Mama, get out the window. All right. I'm gonna go get the guns, mama. Y'all children get down right now. You go right now. Get down. Get down. Let's go. Why aren't y'all going home? Hey, sir. We won't talk to Vessel. You get him out here. Right now. Mr. Walker, my boy don't know nothing about this business. I was there with Miss Fanny. I seen the man's face as plain as day. And most of you men know that that man was white. Who fired that shot? You tell me right now. I told you no more shoot. That's right. They fire on and delete his mother in cold blood on her porch. Now, I'm not going to lie. This was the hardest part of the movie for me to watch. And I shed a few tears the first time I saw it. But this is why Aunt Sarah didn't speak up earlier. Because she knew this would happen. Girl. Let him go, Sylvester. For all we know, he could have been the one that done this thing. He ain't done nothing. What's that, Aunt Sarah? Mr. Wright, would you kindly excuse us, sir? I seen his face. He was white as butter. Oh, Lord, Auntie. They likely to come in here and kill us all. You got to tell him that man was white. Child, you don't think they going to listen to old Aunt Sarah? Just as soon as string me up like they done Sam Carter. You ain't never seen crackers act the way I know. When I was a little girl, about seven, old Master's son stole $20. Out of the... Master knew he took it. Just the same. He ripped my daddy half to death. Don't matter what man was beating on Fanny Taylor. That's another word for guilty. You seen this boy, sir? No, Mr. Ellis. I ain't seen nothing. These people had already made it up in their mind and were determined to shed blood. She went out there as a last-ditch effort to save her family. And I'm sure she knew what was going to happen. Now, you would think at this moment, clearer heads would prevail, that after taking the life of an unarmed old woman, they'd stop. But no, they then proceed to pump the house full of lead, with no regard for the women or children inside. Now, Johnny Wright, who allegedly cares for the people of Rosewood, watches this from the safety and comfort of his own home. And he, after calling Mr. Mann a coward, doesn't do a damn thing to help or even stop the massacre. Now, Carrier was able to get two of them, which causes the rest to retreat for more ammo. But look at where they go to get more arms and more ammunition to good old Johnny Wright's store. 
Again, he refused to sell ammunition to Sylvester, but he's got no problem allowing the good old boys to load up for free so they can go back to the carrier house and light it up again. But this is all he's worried about. Am I going to pay for all this? Yep, that's right. Who's going to pay for all of this? He's worried about his pockets, not the people they're going to use the ammunition on. While this is going on, Sylvester devises a plan so that the women and the children can escape while he remains behind as a distraction. It's an unfortunate decision, but it works. Scrappy, Gertrude, and the kids escape into the woods while Sylvester seemingly meets his demise. Afterwards, James Taylor returns home to tell his wife Fanny that Aunt Sarah is no more. Aunt Sarah come in the morning. She clean up. Aunt Sarah ain't coming. No, you right. It's Sunday. Aunt Sarah ain't coming no more. She's dead. No. Sylvester too. No. Tail. No. Sam Carpenter. <laughs> Half of Rosewood's dead and they ain't caught your n***er <laughs> yet. Why well, they heard that old woman. Now the thing that angers me about this scene is how oblivious Fanny is to the entire situation. This is 1920s Florida and she's a grown woman. She's not ignorant to the consequences of what would happen. She had to know that when you accuse a black man of doing something to a white woman, all hell is gonna break loose. And it never ceases to amaze me how some, and I want to emphasize some women, can escalate or initiate violence with no regard for the outcome and have the audacity to act shocked and surprised when things go bad. It's like they have no concept of danger and move recklessly as a result. But most importantly, this is why men should not be quick to action just because a woman says something happened. Because this world is full of Fanny Taylors, women who will lie to punish or weasel out of a situation. Later that night, word spreads throughout the state, but not for the reasons you think. That right there is the county judge calling in reinforcements across Florida, not to stop the good old boys from doing what they're doing in Rosewood. To the contrary, he's calling it a Negro rebellion, and so he's requesting more goons. He runs a full-on race war. But the next day, Rosewood goes silent. Most people stay in their homes, some hide in the woods, others flee town altogether. Yet still, the cavalry arrives. People from across the county show up, including the clan. And by day three, it quickly becomes a frenzy. Now I can't show it on YouTube, but the film shows black men being hunted down and hung from trees all over town. They aren't even asking questions. If they see a black face, they're going to string them up. Again, this is no longer about Jesse Hunter or even finding Fanny's suspect. This is an all-out extermination. Later that night, we're taken back to Johnny Wright's store. And there we see John Bradley, the man whose land was for sale at auction. He's been hit, and he's asking Johnny Wright for help. Mr. Wright, you have to hide me. You're crazy. I can't run. Mr. Wright, I don't know where my boys are. And my baby girl is somewhere in the woods. Mr. Wright, they killed my Virginia. They find you here, they burn my store. <gasps> You best run hide in the woods. I can't run. I got shot through my side. I can pay you. We'll put you in the back store room. Talk about that deed later, Bradley. God bless you, John Ray. You see that there? His sons are missing, his daughter is in the woods, and his wife is no longer among the living. And all Johnny cares about is getting that land from him. Like I said, Johnny Wright is not a good man. He's no ally. And he uses this moment to enrich himself even further. And next we see what I think is the most important scene in the movie. The good old boys of Sumner, the clan, and the rest of the fellas from around the county decide they want to take this show on the road. And they ride over to Alachua County, looking to raise the same hell they raised in Rosewood. But the white men of Alachua aren't having it. You know what to do now. We got business to take care of. Oh. Turn around. What are you boys doing? You need to get on out the road. We got business to take care of over there. Turn around. You ain't bringing all this into our town. Our colors are law-abiding folk. Brunson don't want you. Now turn around. What are y'all going down hey. on us hey. for? You gonna hey. Now I thought this scene was important because watching this movie as a black man can easily cause you to have hatred of whites, specifically white men. But it reminds you that even in the deep south, in a pre-civil rights era where people remembered slavery, not everybody is down with the bullshit. 
the men of Alachua County were ready to go to war, sacrifice their lives to keep the good old boys out of their county, not only to protect their towns and interests, but also the black people living there. So shout out to them and shout out to John Singleton for putting that in the movie. But later that night, the assault on Rosewood continues and the town is on fire. Again, they're not even pretending to look for Jesse Hunter. They're now going after women and children. And in the film, you actually see women hanging from trees as well. And unfortunately, some of the kids that ran into the woods got lost in the chaos and they stumble into harm's way. But right as they're about to be taken out, Mr. Man arrives and rescues them. And he takes them back into the woods with the rest of the group that's hiding. He and Scrappy meet and hug things out, and he comes up with an idea for them to move even further into the swamp to avoid being captured. But there's a problem. Jewel's father, James Carrier, is with them, and he suffered a stroke. Half of his body is paralyzed, and he can't keep up with the rest of the group. He'll only serve to slow them down. But Man knows that Johnny Wright has taken people into his home for protection, and that's where he takes James Carrier. But watch what happens next. I know you're hiding folk, Mr. Wright. No, no, no. I need you to put away old James here. Listen, boy. Yo, you best take him like go me. hide in the woods. No, I don't want to go in there. Take him and go hide in the swamp. I ain't going to go in that I house, Mr. Wright. Done right? What? I know what you've been doing with my daughter. What? My Why? Daughter. Why? Now. Come on, Mr. Wright. You're the master around here. I ain't a master of nothing. You best get while you can. What's the matter, Mr. Wright? Get. Don't he owe you enough to save his life? You son of a bitch. How much it take for you to hide this man? Ten dollars? Fifteen? It's about to blow your head off, goddamn fifty. I'm going to blow your head off. This man. man's life worth one acre of land. So man calls out Johnny Wright for not wanting to help James Carrier even though he has his way with his daughter, Jewel Carrier, in the back of his store. Because man knows Johnny isn't motivated by kindness, that he really doesn't care about black people, that his sole interest in the black community of Rosewood is financial. But look at who steps up to save the day. Hi, the man, John, for God's sake. Let him in. It's Little Miss Sweetheart, his wife Mary, the stepmother to his rotten children, his newly wedded bride that he's cheating on. Remember, Mary is a God-fearing woman. John, I was thinking we might read aloud from the good book tonight. A good woman. And she's another one of these characters that keeps you from hating all white people. And in this case, white women. But also notice how quickly Johnny listens to her. He doesn't push back. Again, she's his moral conscience. Now this scene right here, I find to be very interesting. James Carrier and his wife go inside the house, but his daughter Jewel, Johnny's bedmistress, doesn't follow them in. Oh, baby. No, Mama, and did you notice Johnny's reaction? He has an opportunity to save Jewel to insist that she come in the house, but he refuses. And he almost looks as if he's relieved that she's going back into the swamp, back into harm's way. Now, even though Jewel says she doesn't want to go in there, we all know she's lying. Because if she really didn't want to go into the house, she wouldn't have come with them in the first place. She would have stayed behind with the rest of the women and the kids. And she knows being in that house is safer than running through the swamp. And the way that she looks back is another indicator that she wants Johnny Wright to fight for her. That look back was to give him another chance to say that he wants to save her, to show that he cares. But of course he doesn't. He doesn't want Jewel anywhere near his wife and kids. But hold on, it gets better. Later, the mob heads towards Johnny Wright's house because they found out he's been hiding people there, specifically James Carrier, Jewel's father. I'm lost. What's the matter? I want James Carrier. Well, I ain't seen him. Hell, I ain't seen nobody. We caught his daughter. What y'all peck with do? Where she at, damn it? That's right, they caught Jewel. Somehow she got separated from Mr. Man and was captured. And I'm assuming that's how they found out that Johnny Wright was hiding people in his home. Now later in the movie, we do see her lifeless body. So we know that the mob is responsible for her death. But it doesn't show specifically what they did to her. But there's no need, it's easy to figure out. But here's the thing. Johnny Wright has been watching this whole situation play out all week, and he's seen what they've done to the women and the children. Remember, he was there when Aunt Sarah was taken out in cold blood. So he knew there was a strong possibility that the same would happen to Jewel, yet he did nothing to save her or her family. Why? Because in his mind, 
she wasn't worth it. In spite of her youth, in spite of her beauty, in spite of her loyalty, she was just another object to him. But getting back to the story, the mob wants James Carrier because they believe he knows where they can find Jesse Hunter. Again, Jesse Hunter, the escaped convict that we never see in the movie, that likely never came through town. And Johnny turns him over to the mob. And once they get him, they mock him, and they bully him for being a stroke survivor. And eventually, Duke deletes him. Now this angers Johnny Wright, and he has some words for Duke. And Duke responds by calling him an N-word lover. They tussle, Sheriff Walker breaks it up, and Wright has this exchange with the mob. You got the money that man owes me? Y'all gonna pay me for all the money I'm losing? Hell no! Killing all my customers! You watch who you call white trash, boy! Just cause you rich! Off no money! You think you better than all the rest of us? That's right. All he cares about is how he's gonna get his money back. So in the next scene, it's day four of the massacre. And Mr. Man is raiding Johnny's store, looking for ammunition. And Johnny catches him. They have a brief standoff, and Wright hands him a box of shells. The two of them go deep into the swamp and devise a plan to get the women and the children out of town to Gainesville. Bring the train to the old road near Kelly's Pond. Kelly's Pond, that's on the other side of Sumner, Mr. Ray. How we gonna do that? You asking us to take these children through all them crackers? It's Kelly's Pond of nowhere. No men on the train, that's the plan. We agreed about the men. Yes, sir. That includes you. And remember that line. You'll see what they're talking about later. So the plan is to sneak the children to the train station. The problem is, they have to go through Sumner to get there. So while Man sneaks the kids through the swamp to the station, Johnny meets with the conductors to get them to stop and pick up the women and children. You asking us to risk our engine, Johnny? Who are you, Bryce Brothers? A couple of rich boys playing on your train? Women and children ain't done nothing wrong to no soul. That ain't fair, Johnny. Don't talk to me about fair, Billy. They shot Sarah Carey down like a dog on her own porch. Oh, Mr. 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 Bryce. Bryce. Lovely day, ain't it? Oh, that it is. Here you go. Thank you, Mr. Bryce. You will. You're a nice gentleman. Oh, I ain't asking you to risk your train. I'm asking you to risk your asses. So while all of this is going on, the good old boys continue on. They return to Johnny Wright's home to see if he's hiding any more people. But as you can see, Mary Wright continues her campaign for being the best wife in movie history. Don't you heathens step touch aside, my man. porch! Yeah, you step aside, we hear you hiding in here. Turn around, Earl, before I send us both to damnation. That damn thing ain't loaded anyway. Oh, yes it is. You got any in there, Mary? You willing to kill a white woman to find out, Bobby? You go, come on. Not only does she protect Johnny's rotten sons, but she protects the people she has hiding inside. And the good old boys back off, as they aren't willing to butcher a white woman. So, just like the great men of Alachua County. What are going down hey. Turn around, Earl. Mary is not down with the bullshit. And though you don't see it in the movie, I suspect that she's the reason why Johnny had a change of heart. Why he decided to help man get the women and children out of town because it was his inclination to hide and do nothing. After all, he didn't want to help James Carrier. He didn't want to help Jewel. And when the mob came, he turned over James Carrier. That's what I mean when I say that she's his moral conscience. Mary, 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 love. Any good that he has in him comes from her. Now we're back in the wilderness, where Mr. Man, Scrappy, and Gertrude are escorting the kids to the train station. Mr. Man notices that two of the kids are missing, and he goes off to find them. But in the process of recovering the kids, he's caught by the mob and they proceed to string him up. But something interesting happens. Show you to my wife. Put him up. Wasn't no colored boy had nothing to do with what happened here. Shut up. Shut up, Jesse. That ain't my name. Now unfortunately, I can't play the video of Mr. Man being hanged. I'm not even certain this image of Ving Rhames is acceptable. So I'm going to play the audio with still images, and hopefully, you'll be cued into what's going on. Why won't he die? He gonna die, he gonna die. His neck ain't that thick. Oh, he'll die. But he probably didn't have nothing to do with it. Truth be told, none of them did. What the hell does that mean, Ellis? It means James. But you know as well as I do what Ben has been doing lunch times. Some of y'all know better than others. <laughs> <laughs> she never listened to her. That one was a wild kid. 
So as you can see, everyone knew from the beginning Fanny was lying. Even her husband James Taylor had his doubts earlier, but he kept on with it. So this entire thing was just an excuse for them to go on a flesh hunt. Now the revelation of his wife being the town pump angers James Taylor. He fights the sheriff, and in the midst of the commotion, Mr. Man sets himself free. Now this is what I call the ultimate RP moment of the film, when James Taylor is forced to accept the uncomfortable truth about his wife. Now I've already shared in a previous video about a similar experience I had back in college, and if you haven't already, check out this video. But men are conditioned from youth to believe that women are angelic creatures, that they're incapable of treachery, and the conditioning runs so deep that even when the woman in question tells them they aren't who they think they are. You're always so gentle, soft touch. Treat me like I'm some kind of angel. You are an angel to me. I'm just a woman, James. I'm just a woman. Men still refuse to accept it. So the conditioning leads to a self-induced state of denial. And when you confront that man in that state of denial with the fact that yes, women are indeed human, that all women, including his wife, are capable of doing anything that a man would do, it angers them. Some of y'all know better than others. <laughs> she never listened to her. That one was a wild kid. That's why he lashes out at Sheriff Walker. Because he's embarrassed that everyone in town knew what he had been holding deep inside him. So we can be mad at Fanny all we want. But the true villain of the movie is James Taylor for refusing to accept the truth about his lion ass 304 of a wife. <laughs> And that brings us to the most controversial scene in the movie, the entire reason why I'm doing this breakdown. It's the infamous train scene. So that was the second half of the plan I alluded to earlier, what Mr. Mann and Johnny Wright were agreeing to in the woods. You see, the only reason Johnny Wright was willing to help, the only reason the train conductors were willing to stop, and the only reason they would be allowed into Gainesville is if there were no black men on board. Only women and children were allowed. This entire scene is a giant metaphor for the black community. First of all, it goes back to something I've often heard Dr. Tia San Johnson speak many times, that when you talk about ethnic prejudice, the conflict is really male on male. Because women and children, specifically women, aren't seen as a threat. Black boys get a pass until they reach puberty, but girls and women are never held to the same level of scrutiny. Going back to what happened earlier, Johnny Wright was not willing to help John Bradley until he agreed to give up the deed to his land. He wasn't willing to help James Carrier, who was an old stroke survivor. In fact, he was willing to cut him down. It was Mary Wright, his wife, who had to convince him. But he was willing to help the women and the children. And only the women and the children. So women, even if they're black, living in the Deep South under systemic oppression, are allowed to circumvent the system. Their gender affords them a privilege that black men don't have, while black men are often disregarded and forced to figure it out on their own. And that's largely because women aren't a threat to dominant culture. They aren't builders or rebels. They're more inclined to adapt to the dominant power or flee from it. For example, when the Germans conquered France during World War II, many of the French women had no problem sleeping with the occupying forces. They didn't care that those soldiers were responsible for the deaths of their men, that they slaughtered their fathers, sons, husbands, brothers, and cousins. They did what they had to do to adapt, to survive, to make their lives easier. It was called horizontal collaboration. And for those of you that study black history, you know that concept all too well by another name, bed wrenching. Sort of like what we see Jewel doing with Mr. Wright. He hired her for what she was willing to do for him in the back of the store, not for the help that she provided in the front. And in the modern world, we have the Russian-Ukraine conflict. When those Russian tanks came rolling through Ukraine, most of the Ukrainian women ran for the western borders. They didn't stay and fight. Again, they left that up to the men to figure out. And that's what we see here in Rosewood. Scrappy, Jewel, and Gertrude didn't take up arms to defend their community. They ran. 
And please understand, I don't fault women for being that way because it's not in their nature to engage men in battle. Even when it comes to masculine women, for all their talk about equality, none of them are willing to fight to be included in selective service. Let enemy tanks come rolling down the streets of America and watch them find their femininity quickly. They'll find a shirt to iron, a kitchen to clean, a sandwich to make, a man to submit to. They'll do anything to avoid going out in that battlefield. You know what, put me back in the kitchen. Put me, grab me by my apron and put me back in the kitchen. There's an old saying that good times make men soft, but hard times make men hard. Well, I believe the opposite is true when it comes to women, that soft times make women hard, but hard times make them soft again. That women are only tough when they feel safe. But I say all that to emphasize the fact that women are not a threat. That's why Pharaoh in the Bible, when he wanted to weaken or break the Hebrew people, spared the lives of the women. And that's why Johnny Wright and the train conductors were willing to help the women and the children. And why it would be no problem for them getting into Gainesville. Because women are a threat to dominant culture. And as a side note, this is why black feminism and womanism is a stupid lie. Why it's all based on a myth. This idea that intersectionality made life more difficult for black women in the pre-civil rights era because they were black and a woman. When the reality is, being a woman eased the burden of oppression for them. Just like in the Bible, Pharaoh wanted to terminate the males, not the women and the girls. But getting back to the movie, the women and children get away, and next we see what should have happened in the first five minutes of the film. Normally, I don't condone that kind of thing, but looking at the context of what Fanny did, the chaos she caused, I'd say it's warranted. And in the final scene, we have the epilogue. We see 70 years after the massacre in 1993, reparations were granted, based on the testimony of the survivors. And we also see the official body count of six blacks and two whites. But according to witnesses, it's somewhere between 40 and 150. And I believe that to be more accurate, given the depth of destruction, but that's how the movie ends. Now for my final thoughts. As I stated earlier, this film is heavy on messaging. And so far we've talked about the train scene, how it illustrates the way that black men are often disregarded and forced to face obstacles with little to no assistance, while black women, by contrast, are afforded a level of grace that black men are given, thus disproving the theory of intersectionality and ethnic prejudice in regards to women. Because racial prejudice is actually male-on-male -male aggression, that men, not women, are more likely to bear the full brunt of it all. Even now in our world, when you talk about aid for the black community, you're primarily talking about women and children, with women being the primary focus. I care about what's in this contract with Black America for women, and, and it's not we're not mentioned at all in the contract with Black America. And I, you're mentioned, know, I mean, when you when you mention Black people, you mention in Black women, so no, don't count yourself no, out. No, yes, that's you not true. Like the black administration said that when they black mention people Black people, not Black, black women. Black, 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 black women are not included in Black people. No. Then there's Fanny Taylor whom I affectionately call Little Miss Me Too, Little Miss Believe All Women. Hers has to be the most obvious metaphor of the film, which is the devastating effect that a false accusation can cause and the consequences of neglecting due process. Again, that's something we've all seen in the real world. We all know about Emmett Till, but there's also the story of actor Merlin Santana of Moesha and Cosby show fame. He's one of many stories I can tell of men who've been deleted because of a false accusation. But I think the biggest metaphor of all is more subtle. It's Johnny Wright and Jewel's relationship, if you can call it that. I think it's an illustration of the way outside groups exploit the black community, specifically in regards to economics and entertainment. You see, Johnny Wright has this relationship with Jewel Carrier that doesn't extend beyond the physical. It's not a loving relationship. He more or less uses her for a get-off. So it's all about what she can do for him. Now in her mind, it makes her think she's appreciated, maybe even loved by him. Because not only does he like screwing her, but he gives her a job. Which aside from being a maid or a nanny, is something that most black women don't have. And I think Jewel symbolizes the way Johnny Wright plays the good people of Rosewood. He comes across as a friendly, cordial white man. And he is to an extent. 
He's providing a service in the community that no one else will seemingly do. And to the people of Rosewood, that makes them think that he cares, maybe even appreciates them. And he a halfway decent white man if there ever was such a thing. The way Jewel thinks that she's appreciated. But the respect and appreciation that he has for the people of Rosewood is strictly financial, just as his appreciation for Jewel is strictly physical. <laughs> He exploits them financially the way he exploits Jewel physically. And as I've said and shown many times in the video, he's no ally. He was more than willing to let Jewel die and turn her father James Carrier over. And he was only willing to help John Bradley in exchange for property. And again, it's one of those messages that applies to the black community today. Go to any black neighborhood and most, if not all of the small businesses there are owned by people outside of the community. All of the gas stations, corner stores, grocery stores, beauty supply stores are owned by other minority groups who, like Johnny Wright, are the largest profiteers in the black community and it's made them rich. And it's the same in the entertainment industry when it comes to culture vultures like DJ Vlad. Adam-22, and Michael Rappaport. They care for the black community to the extent that they can profit off of it. It's an exploitative relationship that's also made them rich beyond their wildest dreams. But just like Johnny Wright, they are allies. They are neutral at best. So I'm gonna close things right here, but before I do, please be sure to check out the other videos in my library, as I'm sure there's something there you'll enjoy. And if you like this video, please share the link on your social media platforms, as I cannot stress enough how far that goes into helping me grow the channel. And that's it. That's all I have to say about it. What do you have to say about it? Leave a comment in the comment section and let's have a conversation. Am I spending my Friday? Some jerk chicken with rice seasoned, red beans and some bread. Got some red wine over here. And I'm watching Layman's Journal on YouTube. Now I'm sure you've heard me say this a million times. So if you like this video, give it a like and leave a comment in the comment section and share the link on your social media platforms. I cannot stress enough how far that goes. And Hell! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! And while I do appreciate you liking, sharing, subbing, and leaving comments, I'm going to ask that you help me go another step further in helping me grow the channel. I set up a membership program for those of you who'd like to offer additional support in the development of this channel. It's not anything expensive or special, it's just 99 cents a month, which is enough for me to continue doing the work that I do here. Help me! Help me! Help me! In the future, there will be additional tiers with added benefits, but right now I need your support so I can cover basic costs. So please, sign up so I can continue giving you awesome content. This is The Layman's Journal. I'm out.